Guys, it's good to see y'all. Good to see you survive the cold <laughs> weather in Minnesota. And um, great result by us. My gosh. I mean, you know, just, you know, a great defensive performance at the end. And uh, guys, I um, had a Twitter poll and uh, had, a, had a list of um, who, what we should talk about first. And the Chris McCann Heroics won the Twitter poll with like 40, uh, awesome. 40 plus. So it's good, uh, great props to Chris McCann. And um, What a difference four weeks makes. Huh? I know, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone was wrongly killing him after the Houston match. Wrongly, in my opinion. And now, I mean, obviously, he and Parkhurst had uh, certainly some man of the match credentials. And I just love the way that McCann played on Saturday. Really saved the day for them. Yeah, what would you think of his performance, Jason? Oh, I mean, he was easily man of the match. Chris McCann, 13 clearances. I mean, the team, 55 clearances to five is just ridiculous yeah. numbers. Uh, Parkhurst and McCann had 30 clearances between the two of them. The play to me that, that just sealed it for McCann as man of the match was late. He wins a header, heads it out wide, chases it down, clears it up the line. I mean, it looked like the cold didn't affect him. It looked like the moment didn't affect him. It looked like he'd been playing center back his whole career. Yeah, and um, just uh, let's quickly talk about the the defensive effort. I mean, going down, you, you spent majority of the match down a man with LGP sent, being sent off. I mean, what does it take? Because well, we, we like we were talking like off airs. Like we, like Atlanta United's never won a match like that before. Being down ten men, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I remember if we've, we've gotten a result going down 10 men last year. So, I mean, it, it's just, like, you know, unprecedented for us, and it just shows another way for us to win because we're so used to attractive um, soccer, you know, playing, you know, smashing, you know, three or four goals in. But hold on with a one nothing win. Away, uh, away in, in MLS is huge, getting, uh, getting three points away from home. I mean, you take the weather, the cold, the wind, being down to 10 men, not really just having your normal game. I mean, you couldn't have your normal touch with, with that type of weather conditions. You just you couldn't play the free-flowing soccer you want to play. And I was talking about it with Rick and John just a bit ago. They were talking about, uh, of course, John's talking about a receiver from Miami saying he's got the dog in him. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know if Atlanta United had that because you think of them, that's not what you think of. You don't think of gritty, grinded-out soccer. You think of fast, fluid, speed. I didn't know if they could win a game this way. I didn't know if they could win a game park in the bus. They did. That's impressive, and that, that says a lot about this team. Yeah, and they're going to have to probably do it again at some point down the road. Yeah, it, might, yeah. it might be in the regular season, might be in the postseason, might be next season, but now they know they can do it, and they can do it in those conditions, which I think is really, really key. In all certainty, almost all certainty, we hope MLS Cup will be played indoors because it would be at the Benz, hopefully. Yeah. But that's not a guarantee. Uh, so now you know that you can win in the elements if you have to play a postseason match. I mean, you know you're going to play a postseason match in cold weather no matter what because you'll play legs in the conference semifinals and conference finals. So if you're playing TFC mm -hmm. or NYCFC or something like mm -hmm. that uh, in the postseason, you're going to play a cold weather match. Yeah. Uh, you don't like the fact that you had to bunker, but now you know you can do it if you have to, down a man, which is a great sign. You know, Jason mentioned the 55 clears, and that's a, a huge, it's staggering number almost. I think average in an MLS match for a side is 20. But 55 clears, how many shots did Minnesota have? 10, I want to uh, say? 14 total. 14 total, okay. Three saves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three. So think about that now. 55 plus 14 plus 3, you're talking about 70, 71, 72 developing scoring opportunities, and only three even got to Guzan. That's incredible, playing down a man. And I think it's going to give this Atlanta United side a lot of credit going forward. If they find themselves in this position again, now they know they can do it. Yeah, and uh, if you're just joining us at stoppage time, I'm with uh, Jason Longshore and Mike Conti on the Atlanta United Radio broadcast team. And um, just make sure you like this uh, like this page and share it to everybody. And uh, please send in your questions and comments. We'll be getting to those um, a little bit later in the show. And uh, guys, um, let's talk about LGP now. Um, a, a lot of people on social media, you know, L LGP has not started this season off, you know, like, like, I mean, like last year. I mean, he was a top defender in the league last year. Starting off a little slow and just being, you know, I understand the first yellow. Hey, you got you got to take you got to yeah, take. Absolutely. I mean, good clear, foul, yeah, actually, a good, good foul, foul. Yeah. strategy. But then you have to know that you know they're gonna try to get you, even if the the shoulder thing. They're gonna make a meal. Uh, you know, they're gonna 
they're gonna fall down it's, easy. It's close enough. You know, and they're gonna try to get you sent off. Mm -hmm. Like, and he's got to know better. You know, in those instances, uh, what you think, Jason? Here's my thing. You know, Chris McCann was ripped to pieces after the opener in Houston. Shouldn't have been. Really didn't play that badly in that game. Now he's the superstar. Gonzalez Perez. Do you remember anything he did wrong against DC or Vancouver? <laughs> was there anything that any problems? I think it was mainly from the Houston, the, from Houston? the, the, the opener one, and then it kind of the one goal. Yeah. Yes. And and now we're questioning Gonzalez Perez as a starter for this team. <laughs> no. What Gonzalez Perez needs to work on is keeping his head in these situations because that's his biggest issue right now. It's not his ability, it's not his game, it's keeping his head because he's getting a reputation. 12 yellows last year. Uh gets I think he's on 3 because he had 2 in this game. He's not going to count for 3 with the disciplinary committee. But that's a lot early, and that's a lot in a year and a month in your MLS career. Now you start to get into that situation where referees are looking for yellows for you, mm -hmm. and he has to change his mindset a little bit. You see defenders from South America go through this. It is The game is called differently here, and plays that would get a yellow here don't necessarily get a yellow there, but he's been here long enough. He has to adjust to the way the game is called because it is hurting the team, and it's hurting the team this week. Yeah, and I would concede that LGP did have a bad day on Saturday, no doubt about it. You are correct. The foul in the first minute was a great foul. Mm -hmm. Have to take that foul. Would have have been a yellow in the 30th minute? Absolutely. Yeah. Was it a yellow in the first minute? Yeah. And that's a discussion that Jason and I had on the broadcast Saturday. Didn't afterwards. have a problem with it. No, but, but a lot of times... Right. In the first minute, you'll get the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. If you're LGP, who's developing a little bit of a reputation That's around it. the league, you don't get that benefit of the doubt. Another example was the foul on which he was sent off, where he needlessly body checked someone after the ball rolled over the touchline. That wasn't even all the time a foul, in my <laughs> opinion. But again, LGP playing on the yellow quite frankly, could have been sent off earlier because he was having problems with Dunlady and fouled him a couple times. He was a step slow all night. Right. So I concede he did not have a good match in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I concede that the one goal he gave up in Houston was probably his fault. Outside of that, I, I, I think it's way, way too early to be indicting LGP based on one goal and 30 minutes in Minnesota. Yeah. And I got a little bit uncomfortable seeing some of the things, even personalities in our radio station, what they were tweeting about LGP during and after the match on Saturday. It's just, it, it's way, way too early to be having that kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. And watch something on Saturday now, okay? Tell me after this LAFC match on Saturday if LGP was missed. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if Atlanta United won this match, but I guarantee you going up against a team like that that plays wide open, scores a lot of goals, you are going to miss him on Saturday. And that's why he's got to manage himself just a little bit better. You know, he, he's not an old veteran player who's getting himself in trouble. He's a younger player. And to get where I think he can be a future captain of this club, he's got to be on the field more. So he's got to avoid these cards. Gotcha. Um... And now uh, I got a great uh, Twitter suggestion uh, yesterday that they wanted to talk about more about tactics, okay. uh, about the match, and uh, kind of, Jason, we got a board here. Maybe talk about after LGP was sent off, how our defensive shape, you know, shifted, like what our what our formation looked like, and how our team, uh, how the defense was so successful in in stopping in Minnesota uh, creating any clear chances like Conti was talking about. So the base back seven is like this. Your center backs, Parkhurst in the middle, your wing backs, and your two holding mids. Nagby will go when he can. So then, when you have the red card to Gonzalez Perez, on the fly, you didn't have the opportunity to really rearrange too much. What they did is they tucked in wingers, and they went to four. But what it was, it played like this for the first half. Two banks of four, sit back deep. Martinez up top as a safety valve. Play him when you can, that's it. So what it meant was Almiron dropping deep on the left, Vishalba dropping deep on the right and doing a lot of defensive work. Almiron was very involved defensively throughout the match, playing in a very deep role. 
So then you get to halftime, and you can rearrange a little bit. And they went back to five in the back. They went to that. But your wing back stayed. So it was a line of five, essentially. Parkhurst would try to be a step further back as more of a sweeper. And then it was a line of three. So it played a little more like that, 5-3-1. And as the match went on, it was very fluid between when, and Gressel was doing it a lot, when he would step up, and he'd try to make a run. So he would come up, and he'd make a run up to try to help. Then it would turn into a line of four. I think that's right, yeah. So the right center back would slide over a little bit. It'd be a line of four. These two would sit back. Gressel was trying to get forward and provide an outlet when he could. Um, just didn't come off. You know, you have to pick mm-hmm. your spots when you're down a man, and then he tried to find his spots to get forward. just wasn't there for him. But late in the game, it was two banks of four, one forward, sometimes a bank of five and a bank of three. Yeah. It was all hands on deck. It, it, it really got away from tactics at the end, and it was just... Dig in. You know what it felt like? Uh, two different sports analogies. One of them from ice hockey. When a team is defending on a two-man advantage, three on five. And basically what you do in ice hockey is you have two defensemen and a forward, usually a center, and they just kind of surround the goal. Right. Okay, mm-hmm. and, and every puck that's sent to the goal, they just kind of try to chop down and knock you out of there. But the other thing it really felt like to me, I mean, if you watch some of those heavyweight boxing matches from the late 70s when it's George Foreman against Ron Lyle and Muhammad mm-hmm. Ali against Larry Holmes, and there's a guy just getting his butt kicked over and over. He's just trying to hold on for the bell. And in the last round, he can't be saved by the bell. So you hope that you, you just play defense, basically. You, you cover yourself, you let the guy smack away at you, and you just wait for the bell. Kind of had that feeling, too. It also felt like stoppage time took about 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I know those of you listening to us on 92.9 The Game probably heard that in, in my voice. And just for the record, and Jason will back me up on this, we did not have a TV broadcast feed in no. the booth. So once the scoreboard mm-hmm. co- clock hit 90, that was it. We did not know where they were in terms of stoppage time. Looking back on it, I think we even talked to Darren Eels about it. They legitimately measured out the correct amount of stoppage time. If they wanted, it was one extra. Well, but now, but there was the whole Garza thing where I could see you could put an added minute, and we'll get to that. Let me get on this one. (laughs) Let me get on this one, Chris Penzo. I've got some words. Well, let's do it because uh, I mean, this was, in my opinion, this could have cost Atlanta United Mm -hmm. the three points. What what happened with Penzo? First of all, going into the technical area of Minnesota to talk to Adrian Heath for some unknown reason. The whole situation was weird. So. Darlington Nagby wins the free kick for Atlanta on the other end. Late mm-hmm. pulls the great little like shimmy move, gets the free kick. Garza comes over to the Atlanta United bench. He's talking to Tata Martino, goes back. Next chance he gets, he clears it, goes down behind the play, holding the shoulder. Hey, he's been out of training this week, so he's had a shoulder problem. I thought it was more gamesmanship. Maybe there's more to it. Anyway, he's down. Adrian Heath and the Minnesota bench was going crazy at this point. And there were a few accusations made that Atlanta United's bench was instructing players to go down and act injured and waste time. My response to that would be, duh. Of course they were. That's what you do in that situation. You're a man down and you're trying to run the clock. So Garza injured, not injured, whatever. He goes off the field. Because the trainer came out to see him. Penso, during all this, comes over to the Minnesota technical area, comes off the field into the bench area, talking with Adrian Heath, maybe an assistant or two. And then when Garza is ready to come back on after plays restarted, Penso does this. Says, no, you can't. Minnesota has a chance. Play goes down the other end, comes back. Garza's trying to come back on. Penso does, no, you can't. About a minute. I haven't seen a referee handle it that way in a long time, since like a kid's game, when you're trying to prove a point to a kid. If you have a problem with Garza's actions in that, give him a yellow and move on. You can't punish him by keeping him off. let Let me rephrase. You can punish him by keeping him off. That's not how professional referees manage matches, and it could have cost Atlanta United. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I was not happy about no, this no, on the I mean, broadcast. On the call, and then um, going to that, and going into the stoppage. I mean, I can't imagine you guys thinking like, 
eight minutes of stoppage time. I mean, that, like that feels like forever. Well, and I'm kind of wondering where they came up with that number, too. I mean, Lorenowitz was down for a little while. Almiron took a ball down. to the face, went down for a very short yeah. while, maybe a couple seconds. You did have some subs. No goals were scored. Uh, what else? Did Parkhurst go down for a minute? Uh, yes. Took a shot to the head. Yeah, Denlotti so, came in late. Right. And you want to throw yellow cards? Denlotti should have had at least one yellow. Right. He was involved in a lot yeah, of incidents. Right. Yeah, and yeah. that one with Parkhurst was pretty dangerous. But yeah. my point, and Darren Eels thought it was fair play for seven minutes. Okay, I mean, th- that's what Darren said. It felt to me like four or five might have been the correct number. And I know we're quibbling over two or three minutes here. That's a big deal when you're down a man, and you've been playing down a man for almost 60 minutes in 10-degree wind chills. So, you know, for as much as Francisco Calvo wants to complain about the league favoring (laughs) Atlanta, and, boy, (laughs) why why would you say that after you lose, by the way? We'll get to that. that. But, you know, for as much as everyone wants to think that there is favoritism to Atlanta, and, uh, you know, some Loons fans were calling Calvo, or not Calvo, um, Penso, a, a coward on social media afterward. They got so many opportunities to at least salvage a draw themselves. Yep. And, and Penzo was a big part of that, the way that he handled the final 10 minutes of that match. Um, yeah, before we get to the Francis... Francis I can't Calvo, wait for that. Yeah, because I, I got yeah. a good rant to go on yeah. myself. Oh, boy. But, um, guys, I wanted to talk about... Um, I know some on, on Twitter, some of the broadcast team were talking about, was this the best win in team history? <laughs> now... Uh, a lot of people will debate on the best best win in team, in team history, but I, I I know we can all agree that Lane Knight's never won a match like that before. Right. And yeah. and if you I mean if if people uh, and saw like the reaction of the players, it looked like we won a playoff mm-hmm. match. Yeah, it did. I mean, it looked like that much of a big deal on like how re, you know relieved, but how pumped. Like, especially Brad Gazan. Brad Gazan was unbelievably pumped. <laughs> I, I mean, thought he was going to hurt somebody. I bet mean, he was like, people. dude, he, lo- he loves matches like that. You know, yeah. but but. Uh, um, but uh, Guys, what, what, what you, what's your personal opinion? On, is this the best win in team history? And everybody, send your comments uh, to that. Too. Yeah, I, I want to hear know people's thoughts. If, on this if it's not that match, then what what was it from last year or you know this year too? But you know, what is what is your best uh, Atlanta United win, win um, in their team history? So we didn't get to see the, the post match coverage on Fox Sports South, but we we get back to the hotel after the match and. We run into Kevin Egan and Dan Gargan and, and Jillian Sakovitz and, and who are else awesome there. people. By yeah, the way. a lot I mean, of fun. They, they're going to be so much fun to hang out with. A lot year. of fun hanging yeah. out with those guys this year. Um, Kevin Egan y- yells at me <laughs> about being the Godfather. Yes. And uh, <laughs> then he asks us about is this the best win in, in club history? And I agree with him. I, I immediately agreed with him. Didn't even think twice about it. He said that on the post match. Gargan laughed at him. And in this week, I think Mike's coming around to it, <laughs> and Gargan's face palming on Twitter. Yeah. So, I think it was because of everything that went into it: being shorthanded, mm-hmm. then having a red, then having the weather, then having to park the bus, which Atlanta United has not done, not had success doing, and they did it, and they get the three points, and it feels like a jumping-off point now going into three huge matches. I think the fact that they were playing the loons is why some people are right. chuckling a little bit at this yeah. assertion. If they did this against Toronto, oh. if they did this against <laughs> NYCFC, yeah. if they did this against, I don't know how cold it gets in Seattle, but if they did something like this in Seattle or Portland, then I think that Kevin's statement would probably have a little bit more credibility. But I'm coming around to this a little bit. Because what does it mean when you score seven goals on New England? You know, at, at some point, you can't shoot a man after right. he's already dead, right? They so, had two reds in that, that too. And, right, and they, yeah, they were down two men. Absolutely <laughs> right. Uh, I still think, and I'll go back to this, I don't think there's much debate about it. I don't think it's in the discussion for this week. The best Atlanta United has played all year was against D.C. United. I still really feel that way, that the yeah. best 90 minutes they have played this year was their second match of the season. I don't think they necessarily played all that well uh, well, clearly they didn't. I mean, they got an own goal, and they didn't really attack the rest of the match. I think, what, 35 36% possession Ooh, when it's all said and done. Yeah. It was 20, 29, I think. Oh, what, so it wasn't yeah. really. Okay, it was I'm thinking of the halftime 29. number. Yeah, you're yeah. right. So, I mean, clearly they did not. But the way that they had to defend, and it goes back to what Jason and you, Jimmy, were saying at the very beginning of the show, is that they've never had to play that way before. Now we know they can do it. And I think... 
you know, for those of you who were not there in person, it's really hard to appreciate just how brutal the conditions yeah. were there. And I even said at one point during the second half, the wind is killing this match. It wasn't necessarily the temperature. It was cold. It was 20 degrees. Right. I mean, that's cold. But the way that the wind was blowing, it was making it impossible to judge balls that were landing in the middle third. Guys were missing headers. How many shanked crosses did we see? Mm -hmm. Ethan Finley put one in the 20th row mm -hmm. that, that negated a really good scoring opportunity for them. So to survive those kinds of conditions, again, I know you're playing the loons. But the more and more I think about Kevin's assertion, I think he might be onto something. It's certainly in the discussion. Now, this is also a very young franchise. Yep. I hope this will not be thought of as the best <laughs> uh, win in team history right. for very long. This wasn't the best Atlanta United's played, but it was the biggest win because of everything that went into it. Yep. The, yep. the best match they played as a whole, to me, might be NYC last year at home, might be Houston at home oh, last year. Yeah. Those are the ones I kind of go to for best overall 90-minute performance, yeah. but just the best three points kind of feels like this one right now. Mo could we agree most satisfying three points? Definitely that. Could we agree yeah. on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I used the analogy on the air. It felt like they robbed the bank. And then someone mm -hmm. posted the, the Simpsons meme of Itchy you know, killing <laughs> Scratchy and then looting his home. Yeah. <laughs> that, that kind of felt like it a little bit too. Yeah. You're running out the front door with the TV. Uh, so yeah, maybe maybe not the best they've played, but certainly the most satisfying one. Yeah. I, I would give them that. Well, yeah, especially, I mean, uh, I mean, a majority of the league, top leagues out there. But I mean, uh, winning, getting three points away from home, especially That's another thing. especially yeah. our especially our form at home is yeah. like you're you yeah. three, uh, three points at home. But when you get when you get three points on the road, I mean, it yeah. just shoots you up in the table. You I know? mean, when you talk about the NFL, when you get the warm weather teams or dome teams who go into cold weather and win, it feels bigger. You know, it's mm -hmm. just it's harder to do. This was a tough match for Atlanta United. It was made tougher because of the red card. Then the win. You can't clear your own half in the second half because of the win. And you found a way. You know, that, that says a lot. And when you get into the playoffs, you're going to have a match where you just have to hold on and close it out. Yeah. And hopefully not for 60 minutes. Hopefully for 20 or 15 or 10. Yeah. But now you feel more comfortable in doing so. And you learned Chris McCann can play in the back, which right. will that's, be helpful. That's really good though. And um, well, we're about to get to your Facebook questions, but first, I gotta get to my boy Francisco Cal Calvo now. Um, Take it away. Well, don't disrespect him because yeah. you know everyone is disrespecting the loons. So make sure you're respectful. Yeah, I've got to be your, respectful. Your but um, <laughs> I, I went on Twitter after that, especially I think I met a guy that writes for um, um, for, the, for the team or, or as part of the local yeah, media there. He doesn't write for the team. I don't want to put that uh, on the part, team. He okay. writes for uh, 55.1, which is not SB Nation, but a, okay. a fan-based website that does that does great stuff covering Minnesota yeah. soccer. Uh, some of his comments so were he, a little yeah, so he questionable. Yeah, so he made some uh, comments, you know, basically backing uh, Calvo on, on the on the comments and talking about Atlanta. Like, why are you talking about Atlanta so much? I'm like... Okay, okay. Oh, I think you missed where this turned. Go ahead, and yeah. then I'll okay. tell you where it turned, because it got weird later. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I missed that one. But first of all, I went, okay, so you're telling me that MLS doesn't hype up a team that you know came in last year that um, has just recently broken the transfer record of Barco, 15 mm -hmm. million, has has set and rebroken mo multiple attendance records, I'm talking about 72,000 plus already this season, broken, you know, um, talking play attacking attacking play made the playoffs last year are managed by Tata Martino the list goes on and on so you're you're telling me that it, they they don't want to hype up Atlanta United like that and then in Minnesota I mean I'm I'm sorry for right now you didn't make the playoffs last year you were you're, awful last year you're playing in a college stadium that uh, I don't I don't know not what, their fault yeah I know not their fault not but their like fault. I don't know what the deal but. is but you know it's just it it's not as much cachet to it and, and, and oh, oh and, and first of all, and we had three designated players signed when we joined the league. They just got their first one. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what I'm missing here that well, why they would, <laughs> why would Atlanta would be hyped up more in MLS than they are. Would you take any player from Minnesota United and put them into Atlanta United's starting lineup? Maybe Dunlady 
but I don't know Not where. Not Martinez. I don't know. Yeah, yeah right. There, where? Like he thing. he's good, but I don't know where you would put him. in Calvo's the very good, but yeah. he's not going to beat no. out Gonzalez, Pierce, or Parker right. to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tiason is very good. He's not going to beat Garza to me. Um, Ibsen was their best player last season. He's very good, but I'd rather have Darlington Nagby as my eight. I mean, there's just they've gotten better. They were incredibly horrible to start last season. I mean, shockingly bad. They became respectable by the end of the year. They didn't make any big changes in the offseason. I mean, their big moves were adding Tyrone Mears to the starting lineup, who couldn't get off the bench in Atlanta by the end of the season. Then you get Darwin Quintero, finally, and that will start to earn them some respect. That's a good move. But that whole situation, the, the, the whole thing in Minnesota is very odd right now because Calvo makes that statement to Megan Ryan, um, one of their local beat writers. It starts to spread around. And the writer that you're talking about first was just trashing Atlanta, trashing the referee, trashing everything. Then he started trashing Minnesota United and saying that it was a listless performance and they were beaten to every ball and things that I didn't think were the case. I I thought what it felt like Minnesota United to me did on Saturday night was consistently run into a brick wall. They didn't change their game plan. They didn't have any solutions. They just kept trying the same things and failing. But they were trying. The effort was there. There was no lack of effort from Minnesota United on Saturday night. So that writer calls out the team. Calvo comes back at him, tells him he doesn't know anything about soccer. And then he comes back at Calvo, and then Miguel Ibarra comes back at the writer too. And it just kept spiraling into ridiculousness. There are some interesting similarities, but also major differences between what's going on here in Atlanta and what's going on in Minnesota. One of the, I think, notable similarities is that Atlanta United and the Loons have pretty good support in their home market. I want to tell you, they had 18,000 fans sit through some of the worst weather you could imagine for a regular season match. They're averaging over 20,000 at home. And that's in the month of March where they have just putrid weather. They have to add seats to the new stadium they're building, Allianz Stadium, Mm -hmm. because demand is outpacing supply. They get very good coverage in the local media from Megan Ryan. They have a good TV deal with Fox. Two papers, actually. Yeah, and the Pioneer Press as well. So they're getting good support, not to the level of Atlanta. Atlanta is kind of the aberration, but for a a second-year side uh, in the upper Midwest, they're getting very, very good support. What I'm noticing, though, is that there seems to be kind of a negative vibe among their supporters compared to Atlanta United supporters. It's growing. And and Atlanta United supporters, I think, you know, and to go back to the LGP discussion for a second, I don't think Atlanta United supporters are shy about expressing frustrations, asking questions, demanding results. That happens in any fan base. But there's a certain nastiness to what's coming out of Minnesota and their fan base. And I think it's a product of frustration because, as Jason said, I mean, they were dreadful the first half of last year. Now, you know, you finally go out and get Quintero. He hasn't been able to play yet, obviously. But there seems to be this momentum that things are turning around for them. They'll go into the new stadium next year. And yet there's still this frustration among their fans, kind of similar to what we saw in Houston. You know, where yeah. Houston has not been able to fully climb out of the hole that they dug themselves, playing some pretty not fun soccer for a couple year period. Now they're playing really fun soccer, and the support it's kind of lagging a little bit. But I'll say this: love their kits. Think it's great that they're going into a new stadium. I mean, it, that will be awesome for them. Um, once they are willing to go out and spend, I mean, Quintero's obviously a very good first step. Go out, bring in a couple more designated players. I think the infrastructure is there for the Loons to be celebrated just like Atlanta United and LAFC are one day. But why wouldn't the league want to celebrate what's happening here in Atlanta and what LAFC did? These are two new franchises with credible owners who are going out and trying to make the league better. Mm -hmm. If Francisco Calvo has such a problem with that, Go to your owner and ask him to sign another designated player or two. Yep. Go to your owner and stop and ask him to stop signing players in the same positions. <laughs> it's, you know, my problem with Minnesota, if I, if I was a Minnesota fan, what I would have been upset about Saturday night was Adrian Heath after the match saying how happy he was with the performance and how happy he was with yes. how his team played. Yes. 
coming off of the week prior where he questioned the effort of his team against New York Red Bulls when they were missing five starters. Right. So it, it, the, the, the conversation coming out of the team is very disjointed. That's something I'd have a problem with. And the fact that they go get Darwin Quintero, who has played up top or on the right wing his whole career. Okay, you have Christian Ramirez, you have Abu Dunladi, you have Mason Toy up top. All right, you have three good pieces up there, and you play one forward, so figure that out. On the right wing, you have Ethan Finley, who's been playing great. Didn't have a good night Saturday night, but he's been playing great for Minnesota. He's probably been their most effective player in the last the last part of last season and the first part of this season. You're not going to bench him. So you're going to shift Quintero into play as a number 10, which is not really his position. Now you're looking at Alexi Gomez from Peru, a left winger, where you have Sam Nicholson, who was Minnesota's best player on Saturday night. And if you played Gomez as a left back, you have Jerome Tiasson, who is their best defender. So why are you going out to sign players just because they're available when that team desperately needs a number 10? If they'd had a number 10, you would have won two or three to one Saturday night. Mm -hmm. You have to get a number 10 who can break down a defense. You have to get a number 10 who can deliver the final pass, and that's what you should go spend on. Don't go buy Darwin Quintero just because he's available. Yeah. Go get the right player for that team, which is a pretty good core. It's a pretty good base. They've added some good young talent. That's great. And, uh, we're about to get to your Facebook questions, but uh, I just want to say quickly, props to Michael Parker after the match. Oh, he won that, Twitter. With that tweet of Eddie Murphy in training places, like, you know, with Minnesota, uh, Darren, oh, Darren, Darren, Darren Eels was, was Darren very Eels angry was about not that. happy. Uh, yeah, if yeah. you haven't heard that interview, go to <laughs> nightsyoundthegame.com or go to Off the Woodwork on iTunes. There's an interview there. I believe the quote was pissed off. Yes. He was not too pleased about that. So. Yeah, he was not a happy camper. Nobody was. I mean, you just can't do that sort of thing in that situation. Yeah. Um, all right, now let's get to your Facebook questions. Uh Let's see, uh, Brett Cash says, Jason, where is your hat? Oh, man, I'm having all kinds of sinus allergy problems right now. Like, hats are annoying me. I have so much sinus pressure. It's just not fun right now. If you have any sinus relief remedies, I will take them. Go ahead and throw them in the comments, the comments. please. I need all the help I can get. Let's see. Uh, and then Brett also asks, uh, odds of seeing Barco in the second half, um, at least against LAFC? Every day he doesn't train, it gets slimmer. Uh, if you can get a run out with him in training this week, maybe. Probably not. Why are you rushing, though? Yeah, you don't you, have to you, rush. You have nine points right now. You, you stole three on the road. No need to rush. These are three very big matches coming up. Atlanta United is going to be this tested in the way. Run. Yeah, Atlanta United is going to be tested in the way they haven't been tested yet this season. But you're playing with house money right now with nine points. No you, need to rush. You'd love for him to debut in Atlanta. But if he doesn't and his debut is at StubHub Center against Ooh. LA Galaxy against Zlatan. Zlatan Galaxy? Uh, Francisco Calvo won't want to look at MLSsoccer.com. <laughs> That'd be very upset. Let's see. Um, let's see. Daniel Monroe uh, says, Come to a live show at Gate City Brewing. I'm here and would love to see y'all while enjoying a brew. So. Okay. We might have to do that. We're always good with talk that. Talk to them yeah. for sponsorship. Get to our sales yeah. team. I'm all about sponsors. Um, let's see. Um, Joe Ramos says, Jason must be serious about that Kangle contract. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm holding out. out. I'm, I'm on strike. Come Let's on, see, Kangle. Um, Daniel Monroe, on a scale of one to a Roberto Carlos, how excited should I be about George Bello? Oh. Oh, man. I don't want to get it Roberto Carlos level. I really don't. But, God, he just keeps doing it. <laughs> that kid just Amazing debut for Lane United, yeah. too. What a pretty goal against Charlotte. Great it's, you just you want to dial back the hype. You don't want to overhype a 16-year-old, but, man, that kid's good. Yeah. Uh, you're going to see a lot of him with Atlanta United, too. Uh, you don't have to rush him into the first team. You have Greg Garza. You have Chris McCann. You have Mikey Ambrose. You have Jose Hernandez. You're going to see a lot of Bello with the second team this year, and if he keeps playing the way he did in Charlotte, you're going to have some interesting conversations in the offseason about what you do. And um, and also I don't know if I don't think anybody's mentioned it, but that Lungus Kunga, Kunga goal. Oh, Lagos, that goal. That goal is unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it's funny that how this week, you know, we're not going to get goal, goal of the week, but we'll You'll get, get save of the week. We'll get it in USL. We'll yeah. get goal of the week yeah. in USL. So yeah. hey, and you should you. get save of the week. I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah because Zan so. there, I think eighty seventh, eighty eighth minute. Yeah. One, uh, Let's see. Um, Sean says keys to the game against LAFC. We'll get to that um, after these Facebook questions. We have a segment on, on that, so just just uh, hold on for that. Um, Ricky Smith says update on Escobar. Um, I, he hasn't been in training. Hasn't trained. 
and concussions, I mean, it's there's not really a timeline here. So it's just on how he's feeling and how he's responding. Yeah. And, I mean, he's in protocol, so generally what that will mean is he'll do exercise. They'll see if they have any post-concussion symptoms after the exercise. If you feel you have dizzy, headaches, whatever. And if he's still having that, they're going to hold him out of training. Not having him for Saturday is huge with LGP being out. Yeah. Potentially. Mm-hmm. Especially with um, – with LAFC, I mean, they're yeah. attacking talent, and I, I, I think the next question um, is uh, who, uh, from Daniel Morales: Who starts in LAFC's spot this weekend? We can kind of talk about this. Um, if we had McCann and Parkers, it's just like kind of lacking that speed, you know, on the back line. So, uh, what do you? How do you think we're gonna maybe set up? It, you've got two different ideas you can do here. You can, if you're worried about the speed, you play three center backs and you play Miles Robinson. You know, he's played 90 minutes, two matches now in USL. You drafted him number two for a reason. You might have to throw him into the fire here. Otherwise, you're probably going to play four in the back. And you're probably going to play McCann and Parkhurst together as center backs, guards on the left. And I would go Zizo at right back because of what LAFC is going to do in their attack. I wouldn't go Gressel there. Yeah. And probably Gressel at right wing, maybe Vishal, but left or switch. That's just depending on feel. Zizo, by the way, has not gotten enough credit. Oh, Zizo I, played I, good. I mean, he mm-hmm. played great up yep. in Minnesota. In fact, even turned on one and got a counter going. Yeah. yeah. Jumped up into it. So, uh, great match by great wet match by Wheeler Amenu as well. Yes. Played a, a really solid couple minutes Very there. Solid. And he could play it right back. The other wild card is to go three center backs with Zizo as the right center back. He did that mm. for the Red Bulls That's last true. year when they switched to three center backs. Didn't stick with it. He ended up getting replaced, but he has experience in that role. A little more speed too. Let's see. Uh, Brett Cash says uh, he thinks he's talking about uh, he's talking about um, the top wins in uh, team history. He says it's definitely one of the top five. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah easily that. For me, it's my number one. And see, Dan Morales says I think the draw in Toronto was the best game we have, we have played. Oh, that's a good point. It could be. Um, that's probably on the list of best overall performances for a 90 minutes. Here again is where quality of opponent might be yeah. affecting our perception of Well, not when you didn't losses. have Joseph Martinez either. Well, true. And Tito Vichalba, that was really his coming out party last true. year. True. Let's see. Uh, John Nason says, Seems that LGP appears a little too casual, almost arrogant at times, assuming he can always play his way out of trouble. I don't think he is at that stage of his career yet. Who needs to have a word? Let's see. I gotta see more. <laughs> who, who needs to have a, have a word? Garza, Park, uh, Parky, or Tata? Uh, probably a combination of Parkhurst and, and Tata. If you're you're gonna have a, that conversation with him, you know, I mean, I like a player with swagger. I, I like someone who is confident. I, I want to see that, but that's actually a pretty good point. You know, it could be that he's just trying a few things more than he's capable of. And you just have to bring it back into your game and, and play your game that you can do well. You know, I mean, he's a young player trying to prove himself. And that's okay. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the card issue to me is different. The maybe issues on the field and the run of play this year, I can see the confidence thing. Maybe he thinks he can play out of trouble when he shouldn't. Keep it simple. The card thing has been a recurring theme. And I, I just, to get where he can be, He's just got to control his emotions just a little bit better and not pick up the needless yellows. First yellow, Saturday night, fine. Second one, you can avoid that. Let's see. Uh, Patrick Cox says, uh, we still haven't seen the true first team squad. No way it's the best game ever. Well, to me, and you could say it's the best game ever because it wasn't the true right. first team squad. That's what's got me excited, though. Yeah. Like, no. you, got, you got nine points in four matches, and you scored eight goals in those matches, and you haven't played the true first team yet. You that haven't is really seen exciting. Garza, Parkhurst, LGP, Escobar, Lorenowitz, Nagby, Barco, Barco. Almarone, yeah. Vishalba, Martinez. We yeah. haven't seen that yet. Yeah. Wow. Let's see. Um, we'll get to a few more, and then we'll get back to the show here. Um, uh, Cody says, Minnesota United will always be little brother of the t- 2017 MLS expansion class. Yep. For now. But I, I think the infrastructure is there for them to change that perception pretty quickly. I mean, th- because, again, they have the fan support. Now they just need the owner to spend. Okay. And, and indications are he's about to. Or yeah, you've got to get process. in your own stadium where you yeah. control your revenues. And, and, and I almost feel like this – we were talking about this with Darren a little bit after the match on, on Saturday. Almost, it almost feels in a way they're waiting to go into their new stadium 
and they're looking at that almost as kind of a reset point. Okay. It, it, they have no control over anything in their current stadium. That is Golden Gophers 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, they control what's on the scoreboard, but but that's pretty much it. You they, can't control the M at midfield and Minnesota in right. the end zones. I mean, and, it's and, to that. And when you sell those 12 ounce hot chocolates, that money is going to the university. It's not going to that. I know that's a little thing, but <laughs> they sold the, a lot of those on Saturday. Oh. Let's see. Uh, Cody asks Is Barco training with the team yet or even doing conditioning? I mean, I'm sure he's doing conditioning. I'm sure he's doing rehab work, but he's not training with the team on the field yet. And then uh, we'll, we'll get to this last one before we get on the rest of the show. So, uh, Patrick says, should, should we give some of the younger guys a chance to fill the voids? Robinson, um, Ambrose? Well, Ambrose I'm fine with if he has to fill the void. Um, if he has to play for Garza, that's not a problem. Robinson might have to just because of the situation. At and also back. Andrew uh, wheeler Um uh, I think he's, he's in that conversation now. I mean, I think Tata trusts him. I think he earned a lot of trust Saturday with his performance, playing in a little bit different role, you know, coming in for Lorenowitz. That's, that's a tough spot, and he did well. So I think he'll be one that goes back and forth between Atlanta United, Atlanta United 2. I think Robinson will try to be picking up 90 minutes wherever he can with its first team or second team, just depending on the need. And if uh, you're just joining us, it's stoppage time. I'm Jimmy Vance. I'm with Jason Longshore and Mike Conti from the Atlanta United Radio Broadcast team. And uh, uh, please send in your Facebook questions. We're going to get to more of those later in the show to close it out. And uh, now we're going to get to the LAFC uh, preview. And uh, kind of before we get into that, boy, what uh, a El Trafico um, classic that was. El Trafico. Um, yeah. I mean, that. I mean that's Latin goal. I mean... On, I mean, he, I mean, couldn't draw draw a perfect MLS to have Zlatan come out and and do that, uh, have that goal, and especially LAFC. I mean, I was thinking of the match. They're, I mean, they're up three nothing. I mean, this match, like you know, going in next week, it's gonna be insane hype. It's it's still very yeah, hype. Still is. It's still hyped, but I mean, coming back from three goals down and then having Zlatan score the the last two to win it, and especially in stoppage time. Well, I, well, and how about Zlatan's first touch? He falls over the ball. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh, God, here we, you know, Jason's right. No gas left in the tank. You know, this, this is going to be a disaster. And, and then that, that goal. Oh. Which, <laughs> and I think we could have a 30-minute debate on which goal was better, Zlatan or what Ronaldo, Ronaldo did yesterday. Did, mm-hmm. Champions League. Uh, we know how Zlatan feels about it. Uh, <laughs> I don't necessarily think he's wrong. Uh, I mean, that... Uh, who, who tweeted that only a couple guys in the world can do what Ronaldo did yesterday? Was it Crouch who tweeted that? I, I can't remember. Yeah, it, Peter Crouch, Peter Crouch tweeted tweet. that. He, he uh, said there's only a couple of us who can do right. that. Right, and he's probably right. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, that's a lot in goal. And what stands out to me was the velocity yeah. that he was able to get on it. Kind of it, it was like a karate chop almost. Right. And we were watching it down in the, the hotel. With, Scared the with hotel Gargan. staff. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny because our feed was like 10, the, the team was eating in a ballroom, and I think their feed was 10 seconds behind us. So we watch it, we explode, and then 10 seconds later we hear the team room explode. Uh, but Gargan had made a, a remark about, yeah, well, there's Lawton with the martial arts again. I mean, well, wait a minute. Does he actually do martial arts? I, I don't know that. But it, it looked like a karate chapel. <laughs> but um, it, it definitely adds to the intrigue for three weeks against LA Galaxy. It does. But, but I, I think it also makes, I'm going to use Darren's term here, this naughty term, it makes LAFC very pissed off coming into Atlanta because they blew it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were up 3-0. That's a road match for them, by the way. Yep. They're up 3-0. They totally blow it. Yeah. Uh, it scares you a little bit because you know how capable they are having scored nine goals in three matches, what they can do as far as their goal-scoring prowess. And I just I get very nervous when I think about a team that, that comes into Atlanta feeling like they have a point to prove as they do. Here's the flip side of that, though. LA Galaxy gave you a blueprint on how to handle LAFC because LAFC had not been punched in the mouth yet, and they were punched in the mouth four times. And what it was is the Galaxy just started pressing higher. And you just put LAFC under pressure because they have a back four that they're still working through. Walker Zimmerman's not healthy right now. Um, you're playing Dejan Jakovic, who's good center back, not at the same level as Zimmerman. You're playing Jao Moutinho at left back, a rookie who Chris Pontius abused on the second goal. And then you're playing Mark Anthony Kay, who was a winger with Louisville City last year in USL, as your number six. And Benny Failhaber, who is a 10, playing as a number eight. 
you can hurt that back six. And LA Galaxy showed a way you can do it. The flip side is you can't turn the ball over because you have Failhaber sitting deep who can spray a pass, and you have a front four that's electric. And yeah. watch out for Marco Arana. You know, all the talk is Carlos Vela, Diego Rossi, Blessing gets some hype. But Marco Arana up top is the perfect number nine for that team because he's unselfish, he doesn't stop running, and he creates space with his movement off the ball. You know, he will pull defenders out of space. That creates room for Vela to make a run. Or he'll go out wide and create a 2v1 situation with Rossi or Blessing. Marco Arrani is one of those unsung players, and he makes LAFC very dangerous. But if you can avoid turnovers, don't let them break on you, and you can press them in the back, Atlanta's attacking six is better than their defensive six. Mm-hmm. And Darlington Nagby, yeah, I feel like we say this every week, but this one especially... Darlington Nagby finding space between Vela and Failhaber and Kay is going to be the key here. You play to him, you avoid those turnovers that killed RSL and killed the Galaxy early, and let Nagby set the pace going forward. Um, well, let's uh, a little. Uh, let's give them a little more a little update on the injuries and maybe your maybe your predicted starting eleven. Um, so um, I saw Lorena once is back in training, mm-hmm. you know. So that's huge, you know. I love him at the six and and um, vital this week. Yes, and then you know, of course, you know, we, we said earlier that Barco um, didn't train today, so that looking not likely he's going to be involved in the right. start in, in the eighteen. Um, so uh, how do you guys? How do you guys think um, Lane United is going to uh, get a, a shape for the, um, maybe the lineup's going to be? I'd probably go four two three one here. I would. I would be a little wary of starting Miles Robinson in this match. I'd have him in my 18 because you have to have the depth. But I would go to McCann and Parkhurst again. I'd go to Garza at left back if he's ready to go. And Zizo at right back if Escobar's not ready to go. And it becomes basically defending with five with Lorenowitz in front of the back two, the two center backs, against LA's attacking four. Nagby drops when Failhopper goes. Mm Mm-hmm. And you have cover that way. When you play three center backs and two wing backs against a formation like LAFC and the way they play it, it's kind of tricky who has who. Your, your matchups become a little difficult because Rossi and Blessing are going to spread the field wide. Arania is just going to run, 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 run. Vela picks the spots. And Failhaber will play from deeper. So three center backs, you don't really need it. And you're not worried about a lot of crosses here, a lot of plays in the air. That's not how LAFC plays. So I'd go with McCann and Parkhurst and Lorenowitz. You expect the veterans to hold down the middle. And Garza and Zizo are going to have to do the work outside to contain Rossi and Blessing. I agree, 4 two, three, one. I agree with everything other than I'm not 100% sure on Zizo. I would like it if they started him, but if we're predicting the starting lineup, I don't know if I would necessarily predict him to start it right back. And keep an eye on Wheeler Aminu. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, only six minutes plus the stoppage time last Saturday in Minnesota. But I, I thought he really showed he belonged at the end of the preseason as well as he played in Charleston. And then with the kind of scramble emergency defending that they were doing at the end of the match in Minnesota, plus the fact that it just feels like he has a little more speed than Zizo. Definitely a little more speed. And that might really be an asset against LAFC. Good 90 minutes from him at right back uh, with Atlanta United, too, against Red Bulls, Mm -hmm. too, as well. Um, And uh, what are your uh, couple uh, keys to the match, you think, where we will, uh, you know, matchups or like you know what we think you think we will we will attack in this match turnovers you can't turn the ball over at midfield against LAFC you will get punished you, you cannot give them an odd number break with Vela leading that break you, you can't do it you'll get punished if if that happens this game's going to be 5-4 5-5 just insanity uh Darlington Nagby finding pockets of space and dictating the play putting his foot on the ball at times and slowing things down will be very important and if Jao Matinho starts at left back, if I'm Tito Vishalba, I'm licking my lips, and I'm running at him all day. I want to I make him suffer as a rookie in this league who I think Chris Pontius gave him a lot of problems. Tito Vishalba is a much more dangerous player. My key is just relax. There's going to be a lot of hype. There has been a lot of hype already. There will be more hype as we get closer to Saturday. Nationally televised match on ESPN. We know how that hype machine gets cranked up. Uh, it's 
next to the Masters, the biggest sports event going on probably on TV at that time. So there's going to be a lot of hype. Just relax. And this is where I like the fact that you can lean on a guy like Parkhurst. I'm glad Lorenowitz is training. That mm -hmm. really helps. I mean, your veteran leadership, Guzan's another uh, to a lesser extent, your veteran leadership is really, really going to help you in a situation like this because there's going to be a lot of buzz, a lot of electricity in the air going into that stadium on, on Saturday. I'm sure it'll be 45,000 again. Uh, and uh, this is a showcase match, but I think it's an opportunity, too, for Atlanta United just to kind of take a deep breath here because you stole three points on the road. You obviously want to get results in these next two home matches, but, boy, these are going to be extremely tough home matches, and you just want to take it one minute at a time. Yeah, it starts uh, this month, a three out of the four at home, and, you know, in, in the away match against LA Galaxy, you know, that's, you know, everybody's dongs right now is a lot, and so it's going to be a big, big month for LA United, and they can really set the tone for this year in the Eastern Conference. We'll, we'll find out right now. MLS Soccer has Atlanta United as the number three team in the league. It's Toronto, it's NYC. NYC is the best team in the league right yes. now. Toronto, last night, huge performance in CONCACAF Champions League for them. Uh, when they get to fully commit on the league schedule, I think they're right there. Yeah. And Atlanta, this next three-week stretch, gets to prove where they are. Yes, and now let's close out uh, the show with your Facebook questions. Are uh, we going to talk about the Scars, by the way? Yeah, we will. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can talk about it right now. It's a good segue that um, we're gonna. We've had such great feedback on these scarves, uh, Jason Conti, that now we decided that we're gonna sell these scarves. So for five hundred dollars, <laughs> <laughs> not quite that much, but um, it might be the value on eBay. I'm not sure about the scarf market now. I don't know about now if we're gonna sell them. Yeah. I might have to uh, put mine on eBay quick. I don't know. So, but um, we'll, we'll get that information to you soon. So um, just uh, stay. It'll, it'll be on sale on our website pretty soon, and I'll I'll tweet it out. So. Just make sure you'll be on the lookout for that because um, these things um, are, are going to be going like hotcakes. Oh, yes. So um, uh, just stay tuned for that uh, for more info. Um, let's see. Now let's get to... Okay, so Dan Monroe, I would not be up, uh, be upset of Robinson starting this weekend. If it's Ooh. in a three-center back setup, that's the only way he starts. Otherwise, it's Chris McCann and Michael Parkhurst for me. But I'm going 4-2-3-1. I would just match what LAFC does, and I think you get... A better defensive shape to deal with LAFC out of the four two three one. If you go with the the three slash five in the back, it's just kind of funky as to who picks up who, and I, I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, let's see. Oh, so Rachel, has, uh, this is an interesting question. Um, how many points would be satisfactory over the next three matches? Oh, that's a good one. I'm thinking four at least. Four at least, yeah. Four is your baseline. Um, you're playing. LAFC, who is now shown they're a little vulnerable, NYCFC, who is the best team in the league, and the LA Galaxy, who, I mean, after that win, you would think they're on the rise. So going out to the Galaxy, you get anything out of that, it's a bonus. You get anything out of a trip to the West Coast, it's a bonus. A win and a draw at home in these next two, I'm, I'm okay with. I'm not going to be upset about. Three draws would be okay with me, too. I mean, I don't want to set the bar that low at yeah. three points, but again, I think considering quality of competition, I mean, you're going to face the best team in MLS in two weeks. With Zlatan now, that might be the best team in the West in Could LA be. Galaxy. Maybe. Maybe. We'll yeah, We're also freaking out over 20 minutes of play, by the way. So, And I don't say us. I mean yeah. the yeah. soccer world. Yeah. Uh, so we need to see a little bit more. But... Uh, I just want to see results in all three matches. Put it to you that way. And if they're they're all draws, I'm fine with that. Just get results in your next three. Uh, uh, to me, um, uh, four is a decent number. I I, I might say five because I, I feel that, especially at home, we need to get uh, we need to try to pick up three points at home. Any uh, yeah, even the time. NYC game is the one that yeah. Is so just tough. you know, three point. You know, I can see LAFC, uh, LAFC get three points and maybe get a draw versus New York. And get a, maybe try to get a draw on the road. I mean, if that happens, but I think five would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, five, five is a good yeah, week. Five's awesome. Five is yeah. a good, good three because weeks. Because then you've gotten results in all three matches yeah. Yeah. if you've done that. No, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Dan Warren says, Science Relief is hot wings, Jason. Yeah. Hot wings? <laughs> hot wings. And wasabi. Oh, I can't yeah. do wasabi. I, I do, I'll go spicy food. So I was thinking about some spicy Asian stuff tonight. There we go. Um, let's see. Uh, Benjamin Bell says, "Why have they not released the blue goalie kit? They the goalie kits are weird. They they should sell more. I know a lot of people want to buy them. Yeah. Um, the team store gets them occasionally. 
I don't think they ever make it to like the online team store, but in the in-person store, I think they have them occasionally. I think they have them at Mercedes-Benz occasionally. So be on the lookout. I, have, I haven't seen that one for sale yet. Let's see. Um, I don't like the gray and lime green one this year, though. I, that's that's not a good look. See, Sean says, uh, how do I get uh, on the on the sweet 99 the game scarf? Well, uh, I don't know if you just uh, joined us, Sean, but um, we'll be selling those online pretty soon, uh, later this week, I believe. So uh, stay tuned for more information on that. Follow me on Twitter at, at ATLSoccer929 or at 929 the game. Um, on Twitter, and we'll have it on the website as well. So we'll get that information to you. And if you haven't seen the other side of it, it has ATL on there, so pretty sweet. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh, uh, let's see your uh, our good friend uh, John Nelson uh, with the next one here. Um, have have to go with the Zlatan power fade over uh, Cristiano Ronaldo's bicycle kick. I agree. Besides, Zlatan will t tell us his kick is better, and that's the only acceptable answer. Pretty much. No, I mean, I'm, I'm sure he pretty yeah. much yelled, you're welcome, after scoring it. Yeah. <laughs> put another ad in the paper. Yeah, I'll probably put another ad with him doing the karate kick and all that. I was, I was trying to tell Orrin, I was like, you got to watch interviews with Slotin. I mean, incredible <laughs> third person. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's it is character. an amazing debut. I'm still wanting to see how everything comes together. Right. And, and the next question for me is, what happens with Giovanni Dos Santos? Where does he play? I don't know how this thing works. Roman Alessandrini, where does he play? How do you fit this, all these guys in? I don't know. I think the Galaxy are going to get very confusing with everybody healthy. Let's see. Uh, Patrick says, can we get a viewing party at Cool Ray on the 21st? Can, uh, come watch Atlanta United 2 and stay and watch Atlanta United in the first team. Ooh, that would be cool. Um, I don't know if the Cool Ray staff would want to hang out Yeah, they'd be there night. until like 1 in the morning yeah. probably. That's a, that's a late match, 10.30 Atlanta time. I that would so. be pretty sweet, but I don't think that's going to be possible. Um, maybe sure. they could leave the parking lots open. You could do a post-Atlanta uh, United 2 tailgate. It's 10.30 Eastern, so yeah. my God. I can't Just midnight. listen to us on the radio. I mean, go yeah. watch the match and then listen to Jason and I on 92.9. There you go. There you go. Um, let's see. Joe Ramos says, like everyone – Else, LAFC will come in wide-eyed. We, we score first and uh, get in their head, and we will get another win. Um, I don't know if this group will. I mean, Bob Bradley definitely not. Uh, well, Fell Harbor's played in World Cups. Fell Harbor's been around. Vela's been around from La Liga. Uh, Rossi played with Peñarol in Uruguay. He's played in these atmospheres before. So I don't think they're going to be as wide-eyed about it. Um the interesting thing to me is Bob Bradley because he's come back to MLS with LAFC and really feels like he's got axes to grind all over the place right now. He's got yeah. more of an edge than he used he to have. Is Bruce Arena's kid his assistant coach or is it his brother? Because uh, they, they've got an arena on their coaching staff. Who if looks it's exactly Kenny like Arena, Bruce. then it's Bruce's son. It's Kenny. Yeah, yeah. then it's Bruce's son, Kenny. It's kind of ironic in yeah. a way. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, well, you hire the son of the guy who got fired so you could become the national team coach. Well, Bob was Bruce's assistant back in the day. That's so true. they've all yeah. been very yeah. close. Uh, Bruce has got a book coming out, by the way. Yeah, oh, yeah. It, and the advanced copy of that got out, by the way. If you have a chance to Google that today, uh, uh Interesting words, interesting words about his hiring and how it got delayed because mm. someone in the Soccer Federation had a, a heart problem. So it, it, that'll be a fascinating Yeah, one. and that probably cost us the World Cup because if Bruce Arena had been there, I mean, and not to say he, he did well at the end. He, he blew the last month of, of qualifying. Absolutely, yep. it's on Bruce. But I don't think Bruce loses the first two games of the final round the way that Jurgen Klinsmann did. Yeah. I think Bruce finds a point at home to Mexico and away to Costa Rica. He finds a point somewhere in there, and you qualify, and you're going going to the World Cup this summer. Oh, let's see. Uh, One more. Got to get upstairs. Yeah. Um, let's see. Daniel Morales has uh, told Gate City to get in touch, so Daniel yeah, Morales might be our new agent. All right. But, um, I like it. Right. Let's see. Daniel Morales, last question. Um, will Logos or Gosselin break into the uh, – uh, uh, which one will break into the first team first? Ooh. Um – I think either one needs probably an injury in front of them to, to have that opportunity, so it's kind of a wild card. My guess would be Lagos because of his explosiveness on the dribble. You know, that's the type of weapon you'd like to have as your last sub running against a tired defense. So right now, Lagos, even though 
you could very easily say that Goslin has the longer career and has more of an impact over time. Might be Bellow before both of them. And that might be true. Well, I know Connie's got to run, but you know, yeah, thank you for stopping by for stoppage time. I'm Jimmy Vance. I'm with Jason Longstrom. I'm with Mike Conti. Make sure you tune in 4.30 uh, uh, on Saturday for the LAFC, our, our, pre, our pre, uh, pregame show. We'll start and then and then hang out with us during the show. I mean during the game, and then afterwards we have an hour po- po- post game. So tweet us pictures if you have a radio at the Benz. Yeah, to we'd us. like that. I yeah. want to see this. Yeah. So uh, thanks again, and uh, just tune in to 99 on the game uh, th- this Saturday, starting at 4:30 for our Atlanta United coverage. And uh, thanks to Meta in the back for doing this for us. And uh, again, thank you for stopping by for stoppage time. <laughs>